How would you like to know a 12-step process that many successful business owners use, including me, to drive the value of their companies to the highest level? A 12-step process specifically around marketing. Yes, that's right, marketing. So many business owners think that marketing doesn't work, but in this recording that I'm gonna share with you on today's episode, I was actually teaching our Value Growth Academy students the 12-step process, marketing process I used to take my company from a startup to an eight figure your exit in 49 months. Today, I want to go over, as we talked about, because this is the number one topic I get from financial advisors, those SEPAs who graduated the SEPA program, business advisors, you name it, is, dude, how do I get more top-notch clients? And so I want to walk you through my 12-step marketing plan that actually worked. So the story was, some of you heard this, is I was sitting in a SEPA program, the Certified Exit Planning Advisor Program in Chicago in the year 2016, learning the methodology around value growth acceleration. And I'd already sold three companies at that point and had a dynamic financial advisory practice. Back in the day, it was more around the broker dealer world where we had variable annuities and variable life, more so than it is today around the fee for service type of environment. But I remember walking away from a program saying, in order for me to reach my family's goals, in order for me to impact the people that I care about, the clients that I deeply love as you do the same, I'm gonna have to do things differently. And I can't follow the way that the norm or the masses are going. Therefore, how am I going to design a practice, build a business that not only impacts the people I have the honor and privilege to serve, but how do I build a business that creates, candidly, generational wealth for myself and my family? So what I learned early on is marketing is like a spider. It has legs that go in every area of the business. And oftentimes my, my financial advisor co cohorts or even the, the business owners that I've coached for, for a while now, we don't look at marketing as we should. We look at it as if, can I spend 10 grand and get 10 grand back in two weeks? Or what's my break even point? We ask these analytical questions because we as financial advisors often think that way. So I wanna walk you through my 12 step marketing that works. It, it helped me to take the company from zero, from walking away from a quarter million dollars of recurring revenue to an eight figure exit in 49 months. But it not only worked in the financial advisory practice, literally whenever we reacquired Financially Simple back in uh, December of last year, we had zero revenue and here we are using this exact same marketing strategy. And here we are now within nine months on a low six figure revenue stream. Think about that on a startup business. It works not only for us or for me as an advisor, as a coach, it also will work for all of our business owners that we have the honor and privilege to serve. So I want to walk through this today with you and hopefully add some, uh, add some value for your life, something to think through. As a financial advisor, I had this one idea, this one goal, and that is I wanted to work with business owner clients. Some of you have heard me say that I'm not a financial advisor. I don't want to be, if I had to talk about stocks and bonds, I moved to Idaho, stick a fork in my eye and sell llamas. But it's more about this mindset that I've had since my early days. And that is I'm a business owner first. So everything has to be, every decision I make has to drive me to a point. And so for me, it was, I speak business owners. I, I speak in that environment. Now there's some of some of financial advisors who want to work with retirees. Great. I want a high concentration of retiree clients. Some of our coaching students who want to work with engineers. Great. If that's the target audience, then you need to be very clear. We're, we're going to talk through this today, but mine was a high concentration of business owner clients. That is what I was trying to achieve, which I found out was actually some of the hardest people to attract because business owners, as my friend Joe Strazeri says, was like junkyard dogs. They can sniff a salesperson out a long ways away and oftentimes they will, um, they'll run for the hills. Using this methodology, just as a quantifier, I was able to take and build a business from scratch in the RIA space, the Registered Investment Advisor space, which some would argue is the most compliant ridden business that we can have, grow up from zero to eight figures in 49 months. What I'm going to show you is not magic, if an old country boy from Southeast Georgia can do this, a live on a dirt road in East Tennessee can do this, anybody can do what I'm fixing to show you. So let's get into it. When we look at a marketing plan, we know this, this is not gonna be right, nothing new here, but we know that we always have an executive summary. Executive summary is going to identify what the business 
and what the reason of the marketing plan is for. Now, here's where it gets tough is we want a marketing plan, something that's in writing, something that we can show our team, something that we can honestly show our customers. I'm going to walk through that with you. Something that we that we live and breathe. But in order to create an executive summary, it actually comes last. In, in our in our building, we actually have to build the other 11 modules, the other 11 steps of a marketing plan to actually get to the executive summary, which is all most of our clients are going to read anyways. But it, nonetheless, this is what it is. It's basically a short document that summarizes who the company is, why it's important, where you're going, yada, yada, yada. So I'm going to start off with, yes, we have to have an executive summary. Most financial advisors that I coach one-on-one -on -one or in our in our mastermind groups or in our university groups, they do not even have an executive summary of what they're trying to achieve through their marketing programs in their business. So this is one of the very first things that I that I would explore any financial advisor specifically, but any business owner to achieve, and that is to create a marketing plan that begins with an executive summary. Now, in order to create the executive summary and in order to build a dynamic marketing plan that works, well, you have to know some very basic things. Friends, you got to know who you are. You have to know as a business owner, what is your specific vision for your company? Where are you going? Why are you going there? And what are your values? What are your values as a business owner? And what are going to be those driving forces that the team, both internal and external, that the clients, that the customers, that the vendors are going to notice within your company? You can't go any further in a marketing plan until you know clearly where you're going. So the way I describe it is, is the vision is what I'm going to tell the prospective client through all of our marketing material, whether that's on Instagram, whether that's in a webinar, whether that's on our website, wherever it's going to be, it's going to be, where's, where's my company going? So my vision, whenever I had heritage investors was, can I'm here to create a company that's going to impact 10,000 business owners. To with, and I had this whole diatribe. And it was actually a statement that we had on the wall whenever the client or prospect would walk in, or we had it in our Zoom waiting room video system, where whenever they were waiting for me to turn it on, they could see what our vision was. Why is that important? Well, we're going to see here a little bit when we start to talk about who we're actually working with. If their desires and our vision are misaligned, then we're going to end up with a bad client. We're going to end up with a client that's going to waste our time. We're going to end up with a client that is not going to be plugged into what we ultimately desire. Mission is what our team sees. So vision is external. Mission is what our team sees. And they want to know the details. We actually tell, had, a, had a conversation with our team that said, we're changing our clients' lives. One appointment, one conversation, one phone call at a time. Values come into play because people are, are work with those whom they like. The old saying we have on the farm is birds of a feather flock together. And one of the things I learned is that if I'm authentic to who I am, I'm going to attract the right team members. And if I attract the right team members, I'm going to attract the right customers. And we're all going to have the same core values. So before we can get into marketing, you personally have to know where you're going, how you're going to get there, and why are you doing it. And that's where vision, mission, and values come into play. As we look at a marketing plan, we also have to have goals, specific goals involved. So... Here's a couple that I've seen in the industry. One of my goals was the lifetime customer value. I wanted to know that. I wanted to track that and my team would actually, my marketing team would calculate that and give me my lifetime customer value on a monthly basis. That was one of my key goals. And I had this goal of driving my lifetime customer value to a specific number. Now I'm gonna go back as five years ago. Mine was to get $8,500 per customer per year and hold them for a minimum of seven years. That was my specific number. So if we do the math on this, let's say it's let's say it's 10,000 for round numbers. If we know that a new customer can generate, the ones we're targeting can generate $10,000 a year for us and we retain them for seven years, that's $70,000 of potential revenue, not including appreciation of assets or not including additional sell points, et cetera, as, as a customer. Therefore, if I'm potentially with every win I'm making, I can get $70,000 of revenue if their average lifetime value for me is that, then I don't have a problem spending $25,000 to gain one new customer. Now that shocks people when I say that, but it's a mathematical example. My goal, go back to my previous thing, my goal was to build a company. I was actually shooting for $5 million in value over a six year period of time. That was my goal. 
it, it blew past that. But my goal was to drive that particular value. So if I'm, if my goal is to create value within my company, not necessarily income, if my goal is to create value within my company, then one of my marketing goals came to lifetime customer value. I, if I know that and I can see that number creeping upwards, then I know that my spend, which we're gonna talk about here in a few minutes, that my spend that I'm having for acquisition of that customer is not being wasted. See, the problem that so many business owners, specifically financial advisors, because we're so analytical, is we want to go out and we want to spend 10 grand, but we want to see the 10 grand come back in 90 days. And it doesn't work that way in marketing. So if, if I'm tracking one of these, and there's a litany of others that we teach in our university program, different KPIs you can track or different goals you can have around marketing. If I'm trying to narrow down to one specific goal, then everything else that we're gonna go from this point forward in this conversation falls lockstep and it gives me my results that I'm actually looking for. I often hear business owners say, you know, I put money on a billboard. I put money into a yellow pages back in the day. I put money into Google ads, or I built the, paid somebody to build a funnel for me but yet they've missed the foundational work that I've just covered. They never really stopped and looked at their values, their mission, their, va their vision. They never really looked at what goal are they trying to achieve through the marketing department of their company. And I dare say, if you're working with business owners, they themselves have yet to do that. Most of the business owners I consult now, whenever we dive, dive into marketing, it's always the weakest area and they don't know specifically what they're trying to achieve. So if you wanna know how to build a, a marketing strategy that works, you gotta lay the foundation first. But that leads me to the avatar. The avatar, as you may have heard me in various podcasts or on stage or through their various presentations, my avatar was Frazzled Frank. Frazzled Frank had roughly a 20 page document that Miss April helped me build and some of my other team members helped me build that we knew everything about Frazzled Frank. Even this morning, I was talking to a business owner and I said, hey, who is, who is your specific target market? And they're like, well, uh, you know, I work with so-and-so and I work with so-and-so and I work with so-and-so. And because we're not specific, we cannot be dynamic in our marketing. And financial advisors are the worst. We're really bad at it. I'm, I'm guilty because it's such a hard business to work in. I can remember the specific. I had this client that I loved dearly, loved dearly good family friend. This individual is invested in my family's life and they referred me to their best friend. Their best friend was not my target avatar. Talk about a pickle. <laughs> and you know what I'm fixing to say, when you're, one of your top clients refer you to a friend and you say, man, I'm just not the right person for them, it creates a little strife, especially within that relationship. So the avatar, the sooner that you can get specific on your avatar, the sooner your marketing dollars come to work because everything builds as we move forward. So let me ask you a question. Who specifically do you serve? Can you give me a, can you give me an avatar? Can you give me a frazzled Frank, have a picture of them and you know what their top biggest concerns is. You know whether or not they're motivated by fear or greed. You know their specific goals. You know so much about their psychometrics, how they make decisions. See, here's where the values come into play, friends. If your personal values that you use to run your business, if your vision, your mission do not align with the psychometrics, psychographics of your avatar, then you're going to spend countless dollars wasted trying to attract the wrong party. So they work together. And I've yet to see many, many people who, who, especially financial advisors, who take a step back and say, who am I and who do I attract? See, my frazzled Frank was like me. They like to go hunting and fishing. You know, they like to watch race cars. They like to cheer for the Georgia Bulldogs. I'm joking. I'm joking. But they like to cheer, you know, they were SEC down here in the South. They, they're not typically the folks who, who live on the coastlines is the way I describe it. Even though I was born and raised on the coast, most of the people that I worked with were country folk. They were, they were blue collar. You know, they were, they were the ones that Wall Street would often pass over. That was my Frazzled Frank. And I actually, the psychometrics of Frazzled Frank is Justin. It is me. If you look at it, you could identify, hey, Justin just wants to work with people just like him. Now, here's what got interesting about it, is that I, I took my son elk hunting two weeks ago, for the last two weeks. In fact, I'm a little jet lagged from coming back across the country. And while we were elk hunting, we were trying to find a bull elk. We had a guide, we had a coach, if you will, that was helping us, and he harvested his first elk. I was so proud of him. 
But as we were elk hunting, we saw mule deer and we saw porcupines and we saw gorgeous bald eagles. We saw brown golden eagles. We saw so many other things, but we were only looking for one item. The reality is, is whenever we can hone in on our one avatar, we're going to see those other clients that honestly can work with us. So in my own business, I like to work with Frazzle Frank. But as we begin marketing toward Frazzle Frank with the methods we're fixing, I'm going to go over here in a second. All the other clients types would come and they say, Justin, we're not nearly as jacked up as Frazzle Frank is. So if you can help them, you can help us. And then I would take that client. I said, let me introduce you to one of my colleagues who's a CFP, one of my colleagues who's an business value growth advisor who can help you. They are, this is their expertise. And I began building a firm that I could attract one party, laser focused all my dollars for the hot, for my Frazzled Frank, my avatar. But then I began a, able to collect so many other client types that could fill into the firm. So if we know our avatar, then we're going to know all about our avatar. We're going to obsess in a marketing plan over their pain points. We're going to know what their pain points are before they even knew what they were. We want to know everything about them. In fact, the way I often say is if I can obsess over my Frazzle Frank's pain points more so than they have, whenever they realize that their pain point is there, they're going to be looking for a solution. I already have it. And I've already presented it to out there. So they find me. So I want to know where do they shop? I know that my Frazzle Frank loves Bass Pro Shops. I know that. Okay. I know they're going to buy from the SEC conference. I know that. Even if they live in California, they're going to at least shake their hand and say, yeah, here you go, dogs. Yeah, they've been good or fit. they're not very good this year, whatever it is. I know their hobbies. You know, they might like to barbecue. I have a lot of my clients, they didn't like to hunt or fish, but they love playing musical instruments like I do. So we know their hobbies. We know where they shop. We know how they think. We know their buying habits. We know them. Until we have clarity of our where we as a business owner are headed, what we're trying to achieve, who we are, how, who the person is that we want to serve, and what are their problems. Until we get that, nothing else matters. What happens as a business owner, though, is now they want to get into the detail of, well, well, where do I market? Do I go out and build a podcast? Do I go out and buy mailers? Forget all that stuff. Before we even get to how do we market and where we meet our Frazzle Frank, we have to know the journey we're going to take the client on. So literally in my glass board here in the office, I will do this about every, about every six months. I'll walk through the actual customer experience from the very first time that they filled out a, what we used to call getting to know you form, which is our entry level funnel point. From the very first time they did that, how many phone calls do they receive? What are the scripts for the phone calls? What are the meeting types? When will they have the meeting? How will it be said? What is the agenda of each meeting? What emails are they getting? I want to see from the very first time they say, yes, I'm interested to the time when they say, man, Justin, this has been a great experience. Thank you. I want to see every point. So for my company, it was you begin with a financial plan first. You're going to pay us for that. And then you're going to do a business assessment and you're going to pay us for that. We're not even going to bring your assets on until you do these first two things, period. We're not going to bring your money on. In fact, one of my largest accounts, we did not bring his accounts in to manage it for almost two years because we worked so diligently on getting that financial plan and that business plan up and running to know where they were headed. So now we came back as a technician and said, yeah, now we'll help you manage your accounts and now we'll help you get your insurance in place or your legal documents in place or your tax strategies in place, whatever it may be there for. But I wanted to map the customer journey. Why is this important? because you need to know what you're going to talk to that prospective customer about. You know their pain point, but how does your service or how does your product or how does your experience that you're designing for them, how is it going to resonate with that particular customer so that yes, they know you can solve their pain point, but you're going to deliver a best in class experience to them. So I want to map that customer journey out for them. Now, once I've done that, I'm going to look for how am I different than every other financial advisor out there? Unique selling proposition oops, is more like this. We have a four-step success formula. One of my friends, a dear friend of mine, uses the term role. That's his acronym. This is my specialty. Or like I used to say, we teach business owners how to double their net worth every 18 to 36 months. Well, that is unique. I've yet to hear anybody else say those words. In fact, whenever I, whenever I was audited by the regulators, you can't say that. I'm like, well, you mean I can't teach people how to do this? That's not a guarantee. Well, you're right, it's not a guarantee. You're not guaranteeing to do it. So what is your 
unique selling proposition? What makes you different within your locale compared to every other business owner out there? And you need to bring it to a trademark. You need to bring it to something simple. You bring it to something that they can digest that, hey, here's where it gets referable. You know how many times our clients would tell other friends, yeah, good brand and their team over there, they're teaching me how to double my net worth every 18 to 36 months. Really? How are they doing that? You, you would not believe what their customer experience is. Now we have raving fans. So before we even get to the marketing, what we think of, hey, I want to go out and I want to sell myself or I want to sell my wares, my goods, my services in the open environment, whether it be, you know, whatever the venue is, we have to know these foundational points first. We have to do our homework on each of these areas, especially around unique selling proposition. Then we come to branding. We still haven't put anything out in the ethos. We're, what we're looking for now is how are we perceived? I will tell you this, colors matter. Colors matter. You cannot charge a premium price on bland coloring. You cannot charge a premium price on aerial font. Everything has to glare premium value so that you can charge a premium a price or a premium offer. How in the world back in the day could I go into a, in East Tennessee? Again, I'm not in some of the other places of the country where there's a lot of money. We're in East Tennessee. Back when I had my firm, it was number 47th in the country in terms of assets before everybody from California decided to move over and change the dynamics around the last couple of years. That's a whole different story. Um, that's kind of funny here in East Tennessee. But nonetheless, in East Tennessee, we were number 47th. How in the world, friends, could I go in and charge a financial planning fee of minimum 6000 and up, plus a AUM fee of 1.35% and up, plus a 401k management fee of 0.75 and up, plus a business asset management fee or business consulting fee of $50,000 and up. How could I do that? Whenever our industry that at the time, the financial industry was in a race to the bottom of who can cut the fees the most, because I designed a premium offer to a premium target audience, to my Frazzle to Frank, I knew their pain points, and we put everything in alignment before I ever went out to the ethos and started talking to them. So I knew them. Candidly, right now, the reason why Financially Simple has scaled so fast the way it has is because I know each one of you without even knowing you personally. I know you because you're my current avatar. Those who are on this call today, it's not by accident you're here. It's all proven to work. What's amazing is if we adopt these strategies, then when we get to this point of the channels, it's easy. What I've noticed, and I've consulted literally thousands of business owners. I'm currently consulting several one-on-one -on -one right now. They're, they're, they want a lot of attention. I'm helping them on a lot. We, we have our Value Growth uh, University going on. And whenever I talk with business owners who like good bread, I need help. The very first thing they wanna talk about are what are the channels here? Where where should I go out and put push things? Should I go on Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram? Should I write a blog? Should I do a podcast? It doesn't matter. That's the reality. It doesn't matter. Why does it matter? Because your particular avatar is going to receive the information in the way that they are currently receiving it. Your particular avatar could live in blogs. Your particular avatar could live solely on YouTube. Your particular avatar may not even be, may be digitally disconnected and they only want to read newsletters. But until you know all the previous things and you have your branding where it looks right, you have every graphic, everything designed right to align with your values, your mission, your goals, everything that we've covered thus far brings you to the point whenever I see it, I literally can say, you know what? Based on everything you have, you should be doing a podcast. And here is the offer that you should have on your podcast. Now, back in the day when I built my business, what I did is I wanted to set myself distinctively apart. I also had this secondary mission. I want to be a New York Times bestselling author. Some of you read my book, Your Baby's Ugly. It reached number one on the Wall Street Journal bestseller list. I really appreciate that. It was great. But so I designed a system like you're seeing here today, where I can talk into a microphone in front of a video camera, share things, teach things. And then my team, which I built, could then take that information and then disseminate it out into the right ethos. So we knew from my company that Twitter housed all the journalists. 
So anything we put on Twitter was for one purpose, one person only, and that was to get me on Forbes. I wrote for Forbes. I wrote for Kiplinger. I wrote for the Wall Street Journal. I did interviews with TVs. All my Twitter content was specifically for that. We knew that Frazzle Frank lived on Facebook and YouTube. So anything we were trying to target Frazzle Frank, we had to go to Facebook and YouTube. But why in the world would I have now have 500 and some 70, I think, episodes on, on a podcast? It's because it created a venue that I could create content one time, disseminate it out, write a book, create courses, hit my avatar, hit my media plans, hit everything simultaneously. Whenever we think about that, we think about our venues, one of the things that we have to measure is what is our KPIs? What is, how are we gonna measure success? So the amount of money that I invested to put content out on Twitter was not to attract Frazzle Frank. I knew that I was spending roughly $250 a month, that was breakdown, in order to get in front of media type personalities. And if I could get one spot, one television interview, one podcast interview, somebody for that $250 a month, it made sense for that dollar spend. I also knew that, okay, I'm pushing roughly about $60,000 a year toward this book. This book is gonna set me up as an expert witness. This book is gonna set me up as a speaker. This book is gonna set me up as a knowledge expert in our field. It's gonna help me with Frazzle Frank. Yes, it will. When I meet Frazzle Frank and I hand him a book, that's gonna help, but that wasn't the intention. So many financial advisors don't have the same aspirations I had to get on stage or perhaps be a thought leader or to be an expert witness. I was able to do that several times in federal court. But so many financial advisors will see a Justin or some other colleagues who I dearly trust and love and we'll see him pushing things out and we go out and we copy it, not really taking a step back and saying, okay, does my avatar live in this venue? Do they absorb the material in this way? What I know today, if I'm working, is I'm now coaching financial advisors on how they could rapidly grow their company so they can have an eight-figure exit in as little as 60 months. I'm coaching that today. And I know that my financial advisors live on LinkedIn. So if you look at my LinkedIn profile, it is totally dominating specifically for financial advisors. I also know that my financial advisors like to, like to see my life. And so my Instagram has radically changed because I see financial advisors on Instagram. But then we, as financial advisor, myself now included, we are also very analytical. We want to know what we know. We don't want to be surprised with, with a question that we don't know the answer to. It doesn't make us feel good when we have a heart set on helping that client. So YouTube is a way that I can communicate vast amounts of knowledge for people and give it away for free. But I'm measuring KPIs. One KPI that I always track is what's the crossover event going to happen. In other words, if I've dedicated 10K, 10 grand for this month's spin, how long is it going to take me to recap that 10 grand? Depending on your venue, depending on your avatar, it could take as long as 18 months. I have a client that I still serve as a financial advisor on. I have a handful of clients that I, I, can, I keep. And I can remember the first time we did a marketing plan for him in this avenue. We went through all the steps and we got to this point. And I said, hey, when do you expect your crossover point to happen? He said, I want to be able to, I want to be able to spend this much money and recoup it in 90 days. And I said, we're wasting our time. In your industry, read the data points. It's going to take us 18 months. Literally 18 months later, he broke even. Now he spent almost 300 grand over that 18 month period and he broke even at about 18 months. In the financial industry, if you if you do all the work that I just described early on, if you do it, you should be able to break even on your dollar spend in about six months. That gives you time to beta test, that gives you time to make sure your frazzled Frank is in the right medium, that gives you time to make sure your colors, your font, your messaging, your language, your tonality, all these things actually work with your particular frazzled Frank, your particular avatar. So if you're a financial advisor, I would say that you could probably pull it off in about six months time. Now that leads me to a budget. Hold on, buckle up. Here we go. How much money should we dedicate to building a best in class, high value practice? Something that somebody is willing to cough up their checkbook and write you an eight figure check for. You need to have roughly 15, 20% of your total revenue going to marketing. That blows my financial advisor's minds. You see, there's so, mar there's so many marketing companies out there that try to market to us as financial advisors that have never been in the seat of a financial advisor. They don't know what it's like to deal with the regulators. In fact, whenever you do get them in a, in a type of regulatory audit, they're going to ghost you. Been there, done that. For us to drive a valuable firm, 
a firm that's going to create a take this job and shove it moment. In order for you to do that, you're going to have to invest in marketing, 15 to 20%. Now I got up to 30% total revenue spend because I knew that re I knew that marketing dollars are often an add back when it comes to the normalization of my P&L or my, or my numbers when it comes to a business exit. So I had an entire team of people that I had employed both internally as employees and externally as subcontractors, along with ad dollars, along with budgets toward books and videos and courses and you name it. So I had a lot of dollars spent. But whenever it came time for the exit, the very first thing we added back was my revenue dollars. Why? Because most people who are gonna buy our businesses aren't looking at growth in the sense that we're trying to create growth. They're not looking at, hey, can I create a 40% marginal increase this next year? What they're looking for when they write us a check is stickability. Are your clients gonna stay with you for a period of whatever your earnout phase is that you negotiate? So for me, spending the money on, on marketing, yes, it did come out of my pocket. Yes, I did pay my team members a lot more than I took home. Yes, yes, yes. But in the end, after 48 months to have that paycheck come in, and and recoup everything that I'd spent, pretty powerful. Think about it this way from a tax perspective. I was writing off ordinary income and got taxed at capital gain rates whenever I'd sold the company. So it was a brilliant move financially for my family and I. One of the things when you're looking at a marketing plan is you're gonna have to decide on who is going to do what for you by when. And are you going to have internal help or are you going to have external help? There are pros and cons to what I just said. Whenever we teach our strategic planning process with our, with our university clients or our, our boot camp clients or various other clients, I'll actually teach them how to design a, a um, strategic plan that allocates who is going to do what by when. But when it comes to marketing, especially when you build a machine, which is what I would encourage any business owner to do, build a machine that you could create content one time and it gets disseminated multi-purpose out. That's what I'm doing here. If you do that, you may have to have internal people. You may have to have a right hand like my April is or like my Hillary is to me. These two ladies are dynamic. Some of you have met them face to face. They are dynamic team players. Couldn't do what I'm doing without them. But also we have external support. We have external people who help us with video editing, podcast editing, graphic design work, posting on social media. This may surprise you, but I literally don't post my own social media. I don't even respond whenever people ask me questions on social media. That's not me. It surprises people. I don't have time for it. I want to be elk cunning my family. But yet I've trained, I put systems in place to where a dear friend of mine that I have known for 26 years of my life she has full access to my family's photos and she knows me. She talks like me so much so that whenever I wrote, well, whenever she wrote a happy birthday to my wife, my mother actually called me and said, Justin, that's powerful. Man, that's really sweet of you. Like mama didn't write that. She goes, oh, I thought it was you. So having somebody internally and externally that can help you govern your life around the marketing plan, friends, that is dynamic. So I've just given you 12 steps, 12 steps. Notice what I didn't tell you. I didn't tell you where to go market. That's gonna depend on who your avatar is. What I'm saying is if you come back and you build it foundationally through those 12 steps there, when you get to the point of how much budget am I gonna have, you're gonna have the confidence that, hey, if I'm gonna put, name a number, $20,000 a month behind this marketing, it will, it will yield the results I desire because of everything else I've already done. I know who I'm talking to. They know who me. I know where they're at. I know how they're located. I know my offer. I know the experience they're gonna have. I've obsessed over their problems more than they have. Friends, if you do that, old country boy from Tennessee now, live on dirt road in Tennessee, if I can achieve it, you can. Marketing works, despite, despite how many people tell me consistently over and over, marketing doesn't work. It works. There's a reason why Apple spends a couple billion dollars a year in marketing even though they are literally have phones in the jungles of Africa, literally have a missionary over there that has Apple phones and, and towers, they still spend billions of dollars a year marketing because it helps them get in front of their avatar. The same is true for you.